In a 10, 5.50 a.m. One of the scariest parts about this game is the odd time scaling. Without progressing the story, you could spend 8 hours in this game and it wouldn't even be 1 a.m. But after installing Roxy's Eyes, it's suddenly 5.50 a.m. and you need to get out fast. Now there are plenty of things that make this section scary. Firstly, you can no longer save, meaning if you die, you have to install Roxy's Eyes again, which is already annoying enough. You also need to locate an exit, which in the case of the Pizzaplex can be a difficult task to say the least. And suddenly the rules the game was operating on for the past six hours go out the window. It's not the top of the hour yet, but now the moon drop animatronic is roaming and trying to get you. Again, despite it not being the top of the hour. And Freddy now seemingly has infinite battery. But the scariest thing about all of this is the time limit. Sure, I've spent eight hours playing this game, but it's only been six in game. And now you tell me that I have ten minutes in game, and it doesn't even give me five real world minutes to locate an exit in this goddamn maze? Yeah, time limits like that make everything more intense. And at 9, Phaser Blast. Do I love Phaser Blast? Yes. Would I play it all day if I could? Yes, probably. Do I want a VR version? Also yes, but that doesn't discount the fact that somehow Chica decides to drop in when you're in Phaser Blast and I don't get why. Which honestly only ends up making this 10 times harder than it has to be because now you can actually get killed instead of just losing the Phaser Blast game. When playing this the first time I did not expect to see Chica, so seeing her definitely gave me quite a shock. And running around an enclosed space with a lunatic animatronic that is chasing after you when all you really want is to just get up close and snuggle in with those arms, I, I think it's safe to say with 100% certainty that this idea is terrifying. <laughs> but at least you get to shoot things, which is something that I've been wanting from a FNAF game for ages. Being able to like shoot animatronics that actually have cursed my real life at this point. In an aid security office. While FNAF 1's recreation may be terrifying, I think an even more terrifying moment takes place just after that, when you get caught by Vanessa and dragged into the security office when we wait for the police or our parents. But we escape, and seemingly nobody ever shows up. The police never do, and neither do our parents, so Vanessa clearly didn't call anyone. But like with the 5.50am thing, there is a time limit introduced very quickly here, because thanks to Vanessa locking us up, Vanny now knows where we are. So we are instantly introduced with another time limit, however this time, we're stuck in an office with seemingly no escape. So this ends up becoming worse than the last 10 minutes of the game in my mind. Especially because Vanny taunts us by waving outside of the door before coming inside and absolutely decking us. So if you're panicking, much like how Eddie VR did when he was playing, it's certainly going to be rough for you. Yeah, being trapped in the security office with Vanny on your tail, no thank you. 10 out of 10 would not do again unless I have to, which I might have to. And it's seven calling the cops. Let's look at this logic. Alright, Henry knew what was going on with Afton, and that Afton had some shady scenarios cooking in his brain. So, if he knew that this man was up to no good, and he was fearing for his daughter's safety, why didn't he make the call to the police and be like, Hey man, so uh, this William Afton guy is like thinking about killing kids, and probably is the one that's been killing the kids that you're looking for. Like, I mean, sure, maybe you didn't have proof, but you could have certainly tipped them off, and then they could have, you know, found the proof. Come on, they could at least keep a closer eye on it. But you didn't and instead you did a whole load of other sh that in reality didn't do anything to stop William I mean you did one thing that put him out of commission for like 30 years But again, that was only 30 years you could have stopped him You could have actually stopped him in his tracks, but instead you chose to keep your mouth shut That is Afton's plot armor working overtime with no extra pay and in six leave it to fate FNAF 6 was supposed to be the end of the Afton story. I was so looking forward to it. That's what Henry sets out to do in this game. Make sure that nobody remembered what happened there. However, this also figured that the first fire didn't work, so a second one surely will. And in fact, he was so confident in this plan for whatever goddamn reason that he actually let himself die in the process to leave nobody remembering what happened. But he didn't think that even if himself, William, and all their kids are dead, the parents of the victims still know. And as we learned from Security Breach in the duffel bags, there are other parents who remember it too. Like, it's a whole thing in the FNAF universe. They cite the missing children from the Pizza Plexus happening again. If Henry had stuck around to see if the job was really done, maybe William wouldn't have been able to possess Vanny and come back yet again and just kill more people. Henry should have lit the place up, smashed everything that survived, and then maybe you could have offed yourself. But at least make sure the job is done first. Halfway through into number five, worst Easter ever. 
Okay, from an in-universe perspective, in Security Breach, Vanny brought back seemingly this Earth's most prolific killer. But from a story perspective, it also kinda comes out of nowhere and feels forced. And in a game sense, he also just looks terrifying and then sends all the broken animatronics after us. And lore-wise, Afton's back again. However, he's also not entirely back this time, considering how this version actually seems to finally be dead, however only functional because maybe the coded version of Afton's consciousness is inside the animatronic. No matter what, this shouldn't have worked. He shouldn't have been able to have a sentient code form possessed Vanny, but then also be able to be present in his actual body. Like what? Unless this entire time after getting spring locked, his consciousness was instantly turned into a code and that was then controlling the spring trap suit and in a way I guess would make sense. I mean it would make a lot more sense than him being possessed by the spirit of his son. But from everything we've gotten, including Ultimate Custom Night and the man in room 1280, he was possessed. But to be kept alive so he could keep suffering. Okay? Meaning that none of this should have worked. But it did, and it forced Sprung. So this absolute animatronic genius, the technician that made these suits, that handles the maintenance, and has explained to every employee that has put on one of these things, on like the proper procedure for the spring lock suits and making sure that it doesn't, you know, snap and then kill you, including the spring body suit that he uses to kill, ends up climbing inside the suit in a panic in an attempt to make himself feel more powerful. But somehow, he's so smart that he didn't notice the leak goddamn ceiling, which is already a, a health hazard, which you should have noticed beforehand. But then, this also causes the spring locks that were active to snap shut, which would have killed him. However, this lucky mother hubber somehow managed to get possessed by someone who was so pissed at him that they kept him alive through all of his supposed to be deaths because they wanted William to suffer. Did they not realize how counterintuitive that is? The man literally wants to live for Forever, and you are enabling him to do so. Old man consequences is right. Leave the demon to his demons. Rest your own soul so that Afton could finally die and then actually suffer in hell for all of eternity instead of a goddamn dream version that you made up when he was recharging underneath the pizza plex or before he showed up in FNAF 6 or whenever you were goddamn torturing him with all this fake hell you made up. God damn it! Getting close to the end in number three, worst ending. I think it's safe to say that the worst ending is one of the scariest moments in this series, especially in Security Breach. This ending just has you leave the Pizza Plex at 6am through the front doors, however this is labeled as the worst ending for a very good reason, since after escaping, Gregory obviously runs away from the Pizza Plex, but he doesn't seem to go to any house. Instead, he finds a cardboard box in an alleyway and then uses newspapers talking about the children who have gone missing at the Pizza Plex as a blanket. It's also worth noting that one of the silhouettes looks an awful lot like him, it's in the bottom left hand corner. But it doesn't seem to matter though since a red light comes on and we see Vanny's shadow appear behind us or I guess in front of us. She finally got to us which is really weird since you know we're in a seemingly random alley. So how did she find us? And how did she leave the pizza plex with like the costume on and like a knife in her hand? Nobody was suspicious of that even though like nine kids have gone missing here? Fazbear Entertainment has some serious splaining to do. And ultimately, in at number two, Music Man Chase. The Music Man Chase scene and the whole section that came before it with having like to reboot the West Arcade is actually one of the coolest sections in the entire series, but also absolutely terrifying. Not only does it provide another Princess Quest arcade machine, but we also get to run through the hall while an obstacle course is being made right in front of us. There are various different paths that you can choose as well, as long as you're paying attention. Like at one point you can jump over a fallen shelf or run to the left and go around it, although that takes a bit longer. And I actually managed to do this on my first try. I was so far ahead that some obstacles didn't even fall in front of me, they were falling behind me. But somehow Music Man ended up catching me right before I got into the security office anyway, which made me absolutely furious. The complete BS of that moment aside, the next time I tried it, I ended up getting it right, so I think it's safe to say that the Music Man chase is pretty damn cool and horrific. And I mean, like, the giant Music Man spider, or DJ Music Man if you're lame, is also horrifying. Plus the fact that he crawls around on the walls and stuff, it, it makes this chilling. And finally, in at number one, the true ending. The true ending is seemingly the scariest part because it contains a load of the things mentioned above. This is unlocked by finding the secret elevator in the section down in Roxy's raceway, and it's down the stairs, where you're like you're next to where you find the test driver head. This requires your Freddy to have the Monty Claus and Chica's voice upgrade, though, so you'll have to risk losing all your progress. But it does actually auto-save when you get down there, so there's at least that. But like, I don't know, I don't want to have to deal with Monty's boss battle in like one go. 
Cause like that seems like it's impossible to do and I chose to go Chica first, which seems like the easier thing to do and well, I don't know. Whatever. Save states being disabled is horrible. Anyway, after making your way into Burn Trap's area, Freddy will start to be taken over by Burn Trap, and it's up to you as Gregory to defeat him by using the three monitors and pushing buttons to burn him, because you know, that's worked every single other time we've tried it. Players will also need to avoid the animatronic enemies that come for Gregory using the doors to temporarily lock them out, or like, hiding when it comes to Roxy. When Burn Trap is finally burnt to, 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 to death, when you finally defeat him, the blob, which was the tentacle monster ahead of time, will attack you, making sure that he doesn't get free. Freddy and Gregory will be shown escaping and then sitting on a hill together, but the tentacle monster was never really identified, or like their identity was never revealed. But after this game, the Final Fazbear Frights book would have originally released, which would have showed us that the tentacle monster that we would have been talking about would in fact be Baby, or I guess Elizabeth Afton, even if they're using the Funtime Freddy face, which is a whole other can of worms. Because technically Molten Freddy wasn't using the Funtime Freddy face. Why was Molten Funtime Freddy there? I don't know. And it's seven, Blind Roxy. After stealing Roxy's eyes by absolutely smashing her head in with a go-kart, we think she's kind of done for, <laughs> you know? She's on the ground, there's a go-kart on top of her, she has no eyes, you know? So it's reasonable to assume that she's been absolutely wrecked, but in fact, she hasn't. She just relies on her hearing to find you now. And the section right after we blind her and she wakes up is some of the most terrifying and annoying gameplay I've experienced. The sheer act of luring her to attack a door, but getting out of the way in time is annoying enough. Now add in fire to that, that she's able to walk through and you're not. Literally, like you, you cannot physically move through the fire. Like, I figured that like Gregory would die or something if he tried, so I made an attempt to walk through the fire. Nothing. Turns out, Gregory has some extremely precise self-preservation measures, since he knows how close he can get to the fire without it so much as warming him. Like, it's actually like a wall. You cannot walk through it. I guess that was probably the best way to go about this in like a game sense, but like, why even have fire there if you're going to make it a wall? Still, that section, Horrifying. And it's 6 BB World. The various mini game arcade cabinets hidden around the map are actually sometimes playable, like the Balloon Boy World game we can find in the alcove behind the daycare, accessible through a secret poster door in the theater. But the actual game itself isn't all that scary. It's just like an infinite thing and it doesn't really have an ending. Unless you get through one of the purple portals that you can find in the game. Going through one of these will instantly glitch out the BB World game, and if you stay in the line long enough, you'll eventually be floating over nothing, with the sun just staring at you until it fills the screen and then the game shuts off. I feel like there was at least like intended to be some bigger mystery here since this is hinted at throughout the lore bags, but perhaps it was cut or not completed since we now know that the game was released unfinished. They could be saving it for DLC or it could never really matter, but the whole glitched portion of the Bloom Boy game is seriously creepy and I'm glad that it, I, I, I don't have to deal with it much. I mean like I want to get to the bottom of this if possible so I do plan on playing through it, I just need to find the time to do so and I only plan on doing it at once. Halfway through into number 5, Post Game. Honestly, from an emotional and mental health standpoint, the FNAF Security Breach Post Game is the scariest thing of all. The fact that you are unable to save is absolutely atrocious, and like, I get why it would be a thing, but holy crap. Like, now that we have this insane ability to see where everything is, including secret disks that can only spawn in when we're looking at them, we are now unable to save. If you close your game, you lose everything. You either do it all at once, or not at all. And honestly, that's some of the scariest damn shit ever. I hate having my progress be regressed. Like, it feels like I'm wasting my time, and I hate wasting my time. So in addition to being a terrible game mechanic, I hate the fact that everything I can do can be lost. Like, it never happened. And that to me is one of the scariest things. But I know it's not scary in a more common sense, so I'm only putting it at number five. But please, Steel Wool, if you're somehow watching this, even though I tagged you on my Instagram story and you never saw it, please, for the love of God, fix this in an update. Allow us to like enable post game saving in the settings or something so that it's an option. Because like it would be really useful if it was. Or like enable it like every real world hour. Like after an hour the save stations are active for like two minutes so that we need to find one fast or something. Please. Anything. And at four, Princess Quest. While Princess Quest may lead to the best and least disturbing ending of the game, 
forgetting about the fact that you go get ice cream with the woman who was trying to kill you for six hours. The actual games themselves are kind of scary. Like the Princess Quest mini games themselves are kind of spooky. You're alone in a dark room, hardly able to see around you, and then these like possessed women rabbit things that are meant to represent Vanny come flying after you. In the first game, you have to like run down this hallway, then come back up it on a platform, grab a key from a chest, then go all the way back down the platform so you can come back down the hall. But then, after you get the key, all of a sudden there are like 10 of these Vanny knockoffs coming after you. It actually like, it made me jump a bit the first time I played it. Especially given that I have never gotten the chance to play a Princess Quest game before. Uh, it also crashed my game when I completed it, so I don't know what to make of that either. Getting close to the end, in at number three, Moondrop. While there are plenty of times that Gregory could have been made in this game, particularly when Freddy gets grabbed by the Moondrop animatronic right outside of Parts and Service, that should have been it. You're trying to tell me that the daycare attendant, the, the dude who really wants to get us, told Vanessa that Freddy was in Parts and Service, in, in the room or whatever, but didn't mention that we were in the recharge station that was right next to it? I mean, like, he knew we were there. He waved at us while taking Freddy away. What? Then, when she talks to Freddy, she's talking as if she doesn't know that we're listening in. It's almost like they put on a show. Like, sure, the daycare attendant isn't able to get us if we're in a recharge station, but we clearly aren't invisible to him because he literally waves at us. So why wouldn't he inform Vanessa about this while mentioning Freddy? And if he did, why not bring that up when talking to Freddy instead of just asking him if he's helping us? It doesn't make sense. The daycare attendant not ratting on us is definitely a lucky moment, but I guess, I don't know, maybe he knows that snitches get stitches, or maybe since Moondrop is such a damn creeper, he wanted to save us for himself. Oh god. But ultimately, into number two, destruction. Isn't it convenient that there is a way to break every animatronic that isn't Freddy, that leaves the animatronic broken in such a way that you can remove whatever aspect that you need to upgrade Freddy? Hell yeah it is. Like, it's so lucky that there is somehow a way to break each of these animatronics in like the perfect amount for the animatronics as well. There's no more and there's no less. We don't have to use the same thing twice. And it works the first time. As even like with Chica, okay? We push her into a trash compactor because she isn't actually crawling in. And then somehow we don't get crushed despite her grabbing onto us and trying to pull us with her. We only get pulled into another area of this mall plex thing that we can then get back to the main pizza plex through instead of just being pulled into the trash compactor and having our heads explode. So yeah, needless to say that looking at it logically, it's extremely lucky that there is a way to destroy each of the evil animatronics in a way that allows us to get their specific upgrades, even though we didn't really need to crush the animatronics, and instead could have just chilled in Freddy's room until 6 a.m. when the doors opened. And finally, in at number one, canon ending. During the true ending, or the Afton, burn trap ending, whatever the hell you want to call it, everything we experience is so Freaking insanely lucky. Like, beyond even protagonist standards of luck. We have to fend off Burn Trap's attempts to take control over Freddy by setting him on fire using what are most likely the systems that Henry used to set the same building on fire in FNAF 6. I mean, it's incredibly thoughtful of the ground to only give out at the perfect moments that we fall into the room that we need to, with very easy to understand monitors set up connected to cameras in the various rooms that Burn Trap enters and only those rooms, with buttons that light fires in the rooms that correspond to what the monitor sees. Plus, I mean like, you really gotta think about it. How are these still working? It's clearly been a while. These cameras and old computers are still working for an unknown amount of years after being set on fire that was enough to ruin the building. Not to mention, after falling into a sinkhole that had to open up beneath it. How is this all still working after that? And not only after that, but all of these computer monitors are literal dinosaurs. Like if you go into an abandoned school library, this is what you will see. How did they work? before the fire, let alone after. Okay, my parents have a monitor like this and it doesn't work. And I'm certain 
we took better care of it than a decrepit pizza brand that's been set on fire multiple times. So I don't know what, I don't know how this happened. In a 10 paint cans. After starting the game and getting the, uh, after starting the game and getting to the free roam section of Security Breach where you have the tutorial for distracting animatronics, I just want to mention how goddamn lucky that is, okay? Like, one of the animatronics that you're going to need to avoid, no matter how damn fine she is, you need to avoid her, is literally eating garbage right in your way, but somehow, there's also a stack of paint cans randomly on a random cart in the middle of the hall in front of you. The cart is also, for some reason, blocking the hall, which I'm sure multiple employees love having to take the long way around, but it's fine that it's blocking the way because you can knock over these convenient and empty paint cans so that Chica will come and investigate it. I'd say her taking the way that she does is also lucky, however, this is like one of the only times where pathing makes sense since she's right next to the door that she ends up using, and I think that any other person in this situation would have done the same thing. However, one thing that I don't understand is in at 9, inconvenient exit. During the so-called interrogation and torture scene in Parts and Service from what I've been seeing YouTube videos titled online, Vanessa is questioning Freddy about Gregory and accusing him of helping Gregory, which I mean is true, but she shouldn't have to actually accuse him of that, more on that later. But after telling him that she's gonna leave him down there until he can, his casing can be put on a new endo, which doesn't really make sense if the coding is the issue and not the endoskeleton, like, still. Why would you leave to go to Rockstar Row through Roxy's lift when you could easily have just turned around to come our way and head into the main atrium? That's where Gregory is for the majority of the game. That's where all the animatronics have been spotting him. And it would make more sense to go there than to Rockstar Row, where maybe he was seen twice at this point. I don't know, it seems weird to me. But the reason that this is lucky is because had she chosen to go the more logical route, which would have been towards us, she would have walked through the doors we were hiding behind. And it's not like we have much room to hide around them, okay? The walls on either side of this door are made of glass. She would see us run into the charging station or wherever else we went. So yeah, her choosing to exit in the most inconvenient way to her actually ends up helping us out. And it ain't Freddy. Just, just everything that Gregory does with Freddy seems to work out eventually, even if not at first. Look at what he does before the doors actually close the first time. He sends us to get a pass in order to free him from the green room and then everything seems to be going well. But then for some random reason, without ever mentioning this before, he tells us that he senses that we are broken and that he needs to bring us to a medical tent so that he can fix us up. Whether this was meant to be a nod to crying child or not in this case doesn't matter. Point is here that it didn't do anything, okay? We get a run in with Vanessa that later turns into a TikTok meme, but other than that, we stay the same, okay? We don't get healed, we don't get a band-aid because we could have had the one that's on his character from the start, and we get in that booth, instantly turn around to watch the Vanessa and Freddy scene, and then after that, we leave instantly, and Freddy never mentions how we're still broken. And being broken, in this case, never seems to come up again or cause us any issues. Especially since now, with that little pit stop, even if you go full steam ahead, you can't make it out of the front doors in time. That one little interaction is the 30 seconds that we needed in order to escape out the front doors, but thanks to Freddy, we didn't make it. But he still doesn't abandon us. He just tries to help. I mean, I don't know, it's just, it's off, okay? And if Freddy is evil, him not revealing it there and then is definitely lucky as hell. And it's six security access. Gregory throughout his time in this game steals so many things from the Pizzaplex, not even including all the little like gift boxes you can find around the, the place. He also steals security badges and ends up getting enough to have level seven clearance. It's like a, a four year old or however old he is, okay? Doesn't matter in this case. It's really unclear how old he is or how tall he is because he can't ride the go-kart alone, but he and like he can fit in Freddy's cake cavity, but he can also speak full sentences with proper grammar and knows more words than I do. Like again, no idea how old he is, but no matter what, how is he able to gain level seven clearance? How how are these so readily available for him to steal? And how is it that taking these badges always triggers some form of event that makes everything worse. How are the security guards supposed to use these badges if this is what happens every time they take it? Or you know what, an even better question, how are these security badges just laying around in like really special containers when the security should just have them on their belt with their normal clearance level, okay? Because getting multiple level one passes doesn't end up adding up to a maximum of level eight clearance. That's still level one. It's just a lot of level one. Okay, I don't get it. It makes no sense. It's stupid. How are we doing at number five, Glitched Freddy? All right, 
hear me out. It seems highly convenient that we just so happen to be at the show where Freddy glitches out, and that seemingly, as we're led to believe, this glitch is what causes him to refuse the Afton virus code thing. Like what? How? We're supposed to believe that this glitch, or this, this error is caused by Gregory, given the security threat message that pops up next to the silhouette of a child when we're actually like watching it from Freddy's perspective. But if that is true and we caused the glitch, how is a kid in a group full of kids a security threat? When people are allowed to be in the pizza plex at this time. Like, sure, he didn't have a guest profile or whatever, but if Gregory was the glitch, wouldn't Freddy have glitched again after scanning us when we start the game? Honestly, I think that the hardest part to believe about this, strangely enough, is the fact that we were able to climb inside of Freddy while he was glitching out on stage without anyone noticing. Like sure, maybe he wasn't on stage when we ended up climbing in, but a glitched animatronic is surely going to have some form of personnel around them so that they can get fixed up, especially when he is the headliner and it happened during a show. No way that he didn't go through parts and service before we actually end up meeting him in the first moment moments of the game. That's some strange, like, god-level luck right there, okay? Is that really what happened? Jeez, that's some Talos-level luck right there. Oh, praise mighty Talos. Getting close to the end in at number three, fire. All right, so, during the true ending, otherwise known as the Afton ending or the Burn Trap ending or whatever you want to call it ending, we have to fend off Burn Trap's attempts to take control over Freddy by setting him on fire using what I'm guessing are the mechanisms that Henry used to set fire to the FNAF 6 location. However, I mean, it's pretty convenient how we fall into the room that we need to in this case, with monitors set up connected to the cameras in the various rooms that Burn Trap enters exclusively, with buttons that light the fires in those various rooms that correspond with the monitor, despite it being far more convenient for Henry to light everything at the same time with one button. Think about it, okay? How are these working still? It's clearly been a while, okay? For, uh, based on some comments, apparently the Pizzaplex has been open for at least four years, which I don't know if it's accurate, but if it is, these cameras and old computers are still working four years after being set on fire. That was enough to ruin the building. Not to mention a sinkhole that had to open up underneath it since we have to travel down an elevator to get there. And like, how is it working after all of that? And if you say that it was Vanny, why make sure the fire systems are still working and then set them to be on separate buttons, okay? Plus, now these computer monitors are literal dinosaurs. How did they work before the fire, let alone after. Yeah. <laughs> and ultimately, in number two, Boy Genius. The absolute mountain of knowledge that this kid has exceeds my own, okay? This kid is the size of a four-year-old. He can fit inside Freddy, baby strollers, like uh, popcorn kind of vending cart things that you can find around the pizza plex, and various other small areas. He's too small to drive one of the go-karts alone and has to get one of his, like, the, the, the instructor bot things. But he knows how to restart generators, operate a trash compact, He's strong enough to restart generators, and he's also capable of driving a car as well as identifying the car battery, connecting jumper cables on a car battery properly, and then using those to fix Freddy's recharging issue, okay? How does this make any sense? And how do they solve that issue in literally any other ending, okay? Because Freddy is still going to re need to recharge every hour, supposedly, or at least he says that he does. I don't really believe that that's a story for another day. But like, how does this happen, okay? How do they solve that issue? This kid knows more words than I do, but is somehow the size of a four-year-old. Maybe. Maybe even smaller, okay? It, it makes absolutely no sense. And this kid's weird superpower is what makes this game so confusing. It really only makes sense if he's a robot that's supposed to mimic a toddler who's been operational for decades and has been learning the whole time, okay? Or that Security Breach is really just a cleverly skinned Jimmy Neutron fan game, okay? Which one is more likely here? And finally, in a number one, Free Roam Freddy. We've talked a lot about the parts and service section, okay? Because Gregory just seems to have gotten extremely lucky at multiple points in this chapter of the game, one after the other. However, the luckiest, I think, comes from after Vanessa leaves Freddy in parts and service. She says that it's so that it, his casing can be put on a new endo after either corporate gives the green light or they have someone on the clock who can actually just remove it and put it on someone else. But she doesn't seem to be suspicious that he's walking around Rockstar Row literally within like maybe three minutes if you've played the section 
happened before and don't mess up the memory game, okay? Like, who would have repaired him if not Gregory? There is literally no other living human in the Pizzaplex at this point, and the whole containment cylinder thing is to protect human beings. There are no staff bots and parts in service, and the reason you had to leave him there was because nobody else is working since it's after midnight. Why would Vanessa be so chill about Freddy walking around after that? I mean, like, she literally left him with his head removed, and if she assumed that somehow he did it himself, why wouldn't she then confine him to his room if he's that suspicious? Especially after just accusing him of helping to protect Gregory. It, it was something that confused me so much in my first playthrough, so I figured that Vanessa would pull us out of Freddy if we got too close. But I walked up to her to test it, and nothing. It, it would have been easy to make just a little modification to her code for this part of the game, and make her actually be like, why are you here? Rip out Freddy. Or rip out Gregory, not Freddy. But like, like, come on, you could have made Vanessa a little bit more dangerous at this point, but no, okay? Gregory venting certainly isn't the only thing that's sus about this game. Let me just say that. In at 9, Vanessa. Possessing Vanessa itself was certainly one of the more messed up things that William did, okay? I mean, it kind of sounds weird, you know, and also extremely unrealistic. Like, this guy just pops up in your VR headset, then takes over your body after you collected 16 digital VHS tapes, or cassette tapes, I guess, technically. But then after he takes over your body, you end up killing for him, okay? That's messed up. And, like, not even kind of. That's incredibly messed up. But also, like, how? I mean, like, she knows what's going on, too. She actively talks in hushed tones about how she can't talk to her therapist about it. But, like, Afton got lucky with specifically was that Vanessa has no willpower to actually sacrifice for the greater good, okay? I mean, like, at this point, I feel like it's fairly safe to infer that Jeremy from FNAF ER didn't go crazy because he just saw a glitch trap. I think it's fairly reasonable to say that he got possessed. At this point, Tape Girl hadn't broken up glitch trap into the tapes yet, and he was probably just able to possess whoever he wanted. So, if Jeremy did get possessed, and the possession worked in a similar way to that it did to Vanessa, Jeremy would at times be sentient and in control of his own body. So, if he knew about Glitch Trap, maybe he didn't cut his face off because he was freaking out. Maybe he did it to try to kill the monster that was inside him. And it ate Springlock suits. The Springlock suits in general are also something that William and even Henry both got extremely lucky with. Like, while Henry may not have, like, designed the Springlock suits, he certainly let Afton create them and then allowed for their use in the restaurants despite them being incredibly dangerous to employees. Only putting them out of commission when someone eventually got hurt and not actually being proactive because, you know, they are literal death machines. You make separate animatronics and then you have separate costumes, okay? That's the right move. That's the smart move. That's the safe move. But these so-called business men thought, yeah, I'll put the safety of my employees at risk by making them wear a hot as balls suit filled with robot parts that even with the slightest bit of moisture will shoot those robotic parts right back to where your bones are. What can possibly go wrong? Like, you think that Willy Wonka has OSHA violations? Imagine FNAF's OSHA violations. Oh wait, actually, you don't have to, because we already did a whole list on that. Be sure you go check it out. But seriously, the fact that nobody sued them because they were being put in these things instead of, like, you know, much safer and and cheaper options of, you know, a fabric suit is insane. And it's seven of Vanny. There were a load of complaints about how Vanny was an underutilized villain, and I totally agree. She only shows up, like, maybe five times in the main story, but, like, every time she does, she seemingly is taunting us instead of actually pursuing us. Like, sure, if she gets close enough, she will charge, but in my mind, that's just her thinking, like, oh, I actually have a shot now. Might as well try and grab him. But her just casually skipping while going after Gregory and then only really coming at him like five times in total is actually pretty solid luck on Gregory's part. Like she always seems to know where Gregory is when she does show up. So if she was around regularly, we would have to constantly be on the move. And she also shows up whenever Gregory doesn't have access to Freddy, as if it's like she knows that he doesn't have access. Which would only make this worse for him, but it's fine. Which in my mind at least is pretty damn lucky. This is one lucky duck, let me tell you. In its six, disassemble. In the Phaser Blast ending, the one where you know you push the button instead of playing Princess Quest 3, Gregory actually ends up ordering the robots to disassemble Vanny. Gregory being willing to kill Vanny here is pretty messed up. However, it's lucky that these staff bots even understood that command. Okay, Vanny is a human, not something that's typically seen as capable of disassembly, okay? When a serial killer hacks up a body, okay, the police don't say that the victim was disassembled, they say they were dismembered, okay? This guy kills Vanny and then only gets emotional when he has to go talk to a destroyed Freddy. Okay, like, dude, okay, 
Vanny is literally bleeding out next to you. We saw what happened to Freddy. Okay, that was the disassembly. So, yeah, couldn't you just have said, like, stop or restrain Vanny? Particularly stop, okay? You didn't have to say freaking disassemble. I get that she said that about Freddy and it was fresh in your mind, but dude, okay? You're not panicking about literally anything else. And if the robots hadn't understood that command because, you know, humans aren't disassembled, then it would have caused you a hell of a lot of pain. It worked on Freddy because robots can be disassembled because they get assembled in the first place. Uh, but now I am definitely going to start calling pregnancy assembling a human now, so that's fun. Thanks for that. How we doing at number five? Not a snitch. Okay, I don't know how Gregory survived security breach in general, all right? There were plenty of times that this kid could have got got. Particularly, though, when Freddy Freddy gets grabbed by the Moondrop animatronic right outside parts of service. You're telling me that Moondrop, the daycare attendant, the guy who has been chasing us every hour on the hour, told Vanessa that Freddy was in the parts and service room, but didn't mention that we were in the recharge station right next to it? He knew we were there. He waved at us while taking Freddy away. And then Vanessa talks to Freddy as if she doesn't know that we're listening in. It's almost like they're putting on a show. Like, sure, the daycare attendant isn't able to get us while we're in a recharge station, but we clearly aren't visible to him. He waved. So why wouldn't he also inform Vanessa about a kid in the recharge station while also saying, oh yeah, and I got Freddy. Okay, and if he did, why not bring that up when talking to Freddy instead of just asking him if he's helping us? Okay, it doesn't make sense. Daycare attendant not ratting on us is definitely a lucky moment, okay? I guess maybe he knows that snitches get stitches and that Gregory will tear him limb from limb with a smile on his face if he did, so maybe that's how it works. And it for destruction. Speaking of tearing animatronics limb from limb, isn't it convenient that there is a way to break every other animatronic that isn't Freddy, and then that leaves the animatronic broken in the right way to remove whatever aspect that you actually needed to upgrade Freddy? Hell yeah it is. It's so lucky that there is somehow a way to break each of the animatronics in the perfect amount for the animatronics as well, okay? And it works the first time. And even with Chica, okay, we push her into a trash compactor and somehow don't get crushed ourselves despite her grabbing onto our leg, okay? We only get pulled into another area that we can still get back to the pizza plex through instead of being pulled into the trash compactor and crushed. So yeah, needless to say that looking at it logically, it's extremely lucky that there is a way to destroy each of the evil animatronics in a way that allows us to access their specific upgrades. Even though we didn't need to crush the animatronics and instead it could have just chilled in Freddy's green room until 6 a.m. when the doors opened. So yeah, lucky us. Getting close to the end in number three, first victim. They say that a killer's first victim is the most important since it might end Indicate what really got them to start killing or other psychological clues that they can use to predict his next moves. But in the case of William Afton, his first victim was the daughter of his longtime business partner, Henry, which is hella messed up because she was three at the time. And while we may have talked about how Henry dropped the ball before, this was the year that Afton's life started going downhill in the worst of ways. Because, like, he started killing off kids, and then he sticks with that MO for throughout the rest of the criminal career. Then, like, he also loses his kids after that. But the fact that his first victim was someone who tried trusted him, who didn't really suspect him of anything, even though her father did, is something that I fear. But ultimately, in a number two, baby, this guy is actually the luckiest mother alive. This girl was killed by a robot her father made that was specifically designed to kill. She was then locked away in an underground storage unit where she was regularly shocked and tortured by scientists, technicians that William probably hired so that they could try and find out the answers to why she's possessed. She goes through all of this, is locked underground for like 45 years at least, and then goes on to try to make her father proud in FNAF 6. She literally says, quote, I will make proud daddy, while her father is literally in the building with her. Girl! This man is the reason you are dead. Literally, there is no debate about it here. This is 100% William's fault. And the fact that he didn't put a blacklist of people not to kill only makes this more on him. But you still want to make him proud? And finally, and at number one, the palladium rule. I will stand by this until the day I die. And you know what? I was call I used to call it the platinum rule, but now it's the palladium rule because it's a meme and I love it. The most ridiculous but luckiest thing that has ever happened in FNAF was the fact that William Afton killed people in his own place of business and then did didn't get caught. I don't know if this was always his intention, but like, who the absolute living hell would think that this is a good idea? Seriously. Even if it's a TV show, okay, How I Met Your Mother does have some good lessons. One of those is Barney's Platinum Rule, which is if you have to see the person every day because you work with them or they live in an apartment next door to you, okay, don't engage in some form of relationship, okay? Because come a breakup, which is statistically probable, it just results in awkwardness and pain. And while this isn't the exact same thing, you are at this building all the time. Your name is a part of the company 
company. So why would you think that this is a good idea? Literally go anywhere else, okay? You ended up even getting banned while there was an investigation underway. I don't get it.